Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very happy to have Yang Lu give us the last talk of the semester. They'll be talking about faster algorithms for unit maximum flow. Um, Yang is a PhD student at Stanford. Um, and yeah, well, Yang, please take it away. Hey. Yeah, thanks Eric for the introduction. So um, I'm Yang and this is some joint work with my advisor, Aaron Sidford on faster algorithms for unit max flow. Um, all the sequence of work that's based on the archive links here. I also want to mention that um, our second result where we achieve um, algorithms for unit max flow in time m to the four thirds, there was also a concurrent independent work by Kathoria that achieved the same result. So to, uh, just to give the outline for the talk, first, I'm going to describe recent advances towards flow problems of all kinds, not just maximum flow, just to give the setting for our improvement and kind of how other flow results interact with our result. Then I'm going to give the two main concepts or conceptual ideas behind our improvements. Uh, at a high level, we're calling these energy maximization um, and a way to go beyond electric flows. So our approach is based on something called an interior point method, um, where you iteratively add electric flows to the current flow you're maintaining. So kind of I'm going to explain how to go beyond electric flows in interior point methods and how we achieve a result. Finally, I'm gonna to try to put everything together to give a full algorithm for our problem. I'm going to start by introducing the maximum flow problem that we're studying. In this problem, we're given a graph G, directed graph G. It has capacities on the directed edges. And additionally, there's a source vertex S and a sink vertex T. We're going to say that a flow is any assignment of real numbers to edges on this graph. Uh, the flow we want should satisfy a couple constraints. The first constraint is that it should satisfy the capacity constraints. In other words, the amount of flow on an edge cannot exceed the capacity of the edge. Additionally, the flow must meet demand constraints. In other words, for any vertex that is not S or T, the amount of flow going in um, equals the amount of flow leaving, or like the total input to every vertex except for S and T is zero, where you account for in and out flows. And finally, our goal is to maximize the amount of ST flow um, under these constraints, which is equivalent to the amount of flow leaving vertex S. This problem has a long history and has been studied a lot. There's several applications of this problem, including um, minimum ST cuts, bipartite matching and scheduling problems. Additionally, there's generalizations or extensions of this problem, such as minimum cost flows that also have other applications such as optimal transport. Um, finally, it's also very interesting to study this problem because getting improvements towards it has eluded both discrete methods and continuous methods that are more recent. Additionally, whenever there have been improvements to this problem, it's often led to, well, tools that have applied to other problems. For example, in 2011, some work of CKMST for approximate max flow that I'll discuss later can be readily applied to give improved algorithms for regression problems. Like, in, like L infinity regression, L1 regression, or like LP regression. As for what's known for runtime for this problem, since the early works of um, Karzanov and Evan Tarjan, which got an M to the 1.5 runtime for the max flow problem, there's been several other works. The ones I wanted to highlight were um, an algorithm of Goldberg Rao which achieved the same runtime 
m to the 1.5, except with logarithmic dependence on capacities. Uh, then more recently, the first improvement over the m to the 1.5 runtime in any regime was due to Madri, who achieved an m to the 10 sevenths runtime in sparse, unica, uh, in sparse unit capacity graphs. Additionally, in the case of dense graphs, Lee Sitford gave an improved bound of m root n and um, Modrin 16 was able to improve the capacity dependence on U, though it's still polynomial. Look at this table, it's very natural to ask, can max flow be actually solved in linear time, say even for uncapacitated graphs, it's not known. So our main result is an improved runtime for max flow and building off the work of Madri, um, what we're able to show is that in sparse unit capacity graphs, we achieve a runtime of M to the 11 eighths plus little o of one in our first paper. And in our second paper, we get a runtime of M to the four thirds for the problem. You might be wondering where are these exponents coming from like 10 sevenths, 11 eighths, four thirds. It's actually not too hard to describe. 10 sevenths is three halves minus one over 14. 11 eighths is three halves minus one eighth and four thirds is three halves minus one sixth. And the improving amount like one over 14, one over eight, one over six that we're able to subtract off three halves kind of corresponds to achieving better trade-offs inside the method. Additionally, um, the min ST cut and bipartite matching correspond to the U equals one case. So as a corollary, we get an M to the four thirds runtime for bipartite matching. I just wanted to highlight some other results um, that are even more recent. So um, AMV showed that our methods can be applied to actually solve min cost flows on unit capacity graphs in time M to the four thirds with logarithmic dependence on the costs, but not the capacities. And additionally, um, a work by several authors showed that bipartite matching and the transshipment problem can be solved in time M plus N to the 1.5. This algorithm has logarithmic dependence on capacities and on uh, de uh, logarithmic de uh, dependence on capacities and on like the costs. So um, the interesting thing about this algorithm is that it's actually linear time as long as the graph is dense enough, as long as it is more than n to the 1.5 edges. So. But Yang, what was W? Oh, oh, yeah, W here is the, I just let W be the maximum cost or capacity in the graph. Yeah. So this, this algorithm, the M plus N of the 1.5 has logarithmic dependence on both cost and capacity. However, for sparse graphs, it's still N to the 1.5, but for dense graphs, it's nearly linear. To kind of understand um, approaches to the directed max flow problem, it's actually important to first understand undirected flow problems. Here an undirected flow problem is given a graph G and two vertices S and T, we want to send one unit of flow from S to T um, where a flow is assignment of real numbers, remember, not just an integer flow, but we wanna send one unit from S to T and minimize some function. If we want to minimize the L infinity norm of the flow, this actually corresponds to the max flow problem. And you can see this the following way. Maximizing the amount of units to send from S to T while maintaining capacity constraints. If you scale it down, it's equivalent to, I want to send exactly one unit from S to T, but to keep the amount of flow on every edge as small as possible. So in this sense, max flow corresponds to L infinity. On the other hand, shortest paths actually correspond to L1. And uh, also between L1 and L infinity, you can consider the L2 norm. So this is, I wanna send one unit of flow from S to T and I wanna minimize the L2 norm of the flow. This is called electric flow and corresponds to solving a linear system in the Laplacian of the underlying graph. And 
by some seminal work of Spielman and Tang. This is doable in linear time. Going back to the runtime table, I just want to describe for each of these results kind of how they fit into this framework I just described. For some earlier results of like about um, these m to the 1.5 combinatorial based methods, they work by using something called like blocking flows or something like that. But they're like path based. So I think it's useful to think of them as L1 ish sort of algorithm, like shortest path ish algorithms, even though blocking flow is not exactly like that. On the other hand, the more recent improvements are based on interior point methods. Interior point methods are a method for linear programming that reduces solving linear programming to solving a system of to solving a sequence of linear equations. In the case of max flow, interior point methods reduce um, solving the max flow problem to solving root m Laplacian systems. So using that, you immediately get an m to the 1.5 runtime. So all these results are just doing various tricks on top of that to break the m to the 1.5 runtime in some way. But yeah, um, the point is, uh, because these are using interior point methods, they're solving Laplacian systems, and therefore they're iterating on L2 or electric flows. A sort of point I want to make throughout this talk is just that even though we're still going to use an interior point method, what I'm going to try to explain is how we can not you know, use electric flows as strongly as in previous methods. And in fact, the less we constrain ourselves to use electric flows in our algorithms, um, the simpler our algorithms actually end up being, and additionally, the runtimes improve. So that's like, there's a key point I want people to keep in mind. At this point, I'm just going to describe some other undirected flow primitives um, and natural ways that one could expect that they could be applied to solve the max flow problem. And then I'll explain some difficulties. Um, so the results of CKMST in 2011, they showed that if I only cared about getting an approximate max flow in an undirected graph, then it's doable in one time m to the four thirds times some polynomial in epsilon for one minus epsilon approximate max flow. The way this result was achieved is they used electric flows to iteratively um, improve the amount of flow they're sending. And then they did some tricks to get past the m to the three halves one time. Interestingly, more recently, it's been actually shown that you can do approximate max flow in time m over epsilon for one minus epsilon approximate max flow. The way these results work is instead of using electric flows, they more directly work in the L infinity norm. At a high level, what they do is they build this thing called a congestion approximator, which gives a very crude approximate max flow, like in approximates a max flow up to polylogarithmic factors. Then you can show that using some gradient descent method or L, like L infinity gradient descent method, coupled with this very coarse max flow approximation, you can boost it to be one minus epsilon approximate. That's how these methods work. This brings up the idea for, can we just use, you know, to more directly use things that look like the L infinity norm within an interior point method to get a faster max flow runtime. And while it was a natural idea, as, I tried with, as we're gonna see later, interior point methods naturally induce linear systems and therefore they naturally lead to electric flows. So somehow this board more directly work in L infinity doesn't exactly work for interior point methods, or at least it's not known how. There's several other primitives I just wanted to mention that also seem useful. Um, there's directed Laplacian solvers. I, however, somehow they, it just, it's unclear how to use them. And additionally, there's an, uh, other than like 
L1 norm flows, which are shortest paths, L infinity flows, which are um, max flow, and L2, which are electric flows, you can ask for flows for different values of P, like P norm minimizing flows. There's been some work on this. However, for both of these results, it's not clear or wasn't clear how to apply them inside of the interior point method to get it improved on time. At this point, I wanted to highlight an undirected flow primitive that was shown recently that is actually essential to the success of our algorithms. And I just wanted to mention it here before diving into um, some more aspects of our algorithm. Um, this is the following theorem due to King, Penn, Sachdeva, and Wang. It's another undirected flow problem. And the primitive they're able to minimize is, I want to send one unit of flow from S to T, and I want to minimize the following objective. It's some electric flow piece plus a P norm piece with unit weights. Just to reiterate, um, this is an undirected flow problem, just like the previous ones. It's like, and it supports an, a combination of a two norm and a P norm. The two norm here corresponds to the electric flow part, um, which as I've explained are important for interior point methods. And additionally, it supports a high power of P, like P equals root log N. And this part looks very close to max flow in some sense. Like, you know, the root log n norm and the infinity norm are off by like a m to the little o of one distortion factor. So, so I just wanted to put this result here, mention that it's useful for later and I'll try to explain why. Cool. Um, at this point, I'm going to go into the second part of my talk. Where I'm going to introduce um, electric flows in a little more detail and then explain the energy maximization problem we define to make larger progress in our algorithm. So an electric flow with resistances R um, is the following. I want to send one unit of flow from S to T and minimize the energy. Well, the energy is given by the two norm of the flow F with respect to the resistances R. You can show that an electric flow corresponds to a potential induced flow. So what you can do is you can solve the Laplacian L on the vector, which is uh, one S minus one T, and this induces some vertex potentials. And then you can get the flow from the potential using Ohm's law from like physics class. So here's an example graph with the electric flows. So you have vertices S and T, with a uh, edge of resistance one between them. And you have otherwise three pads between S and T. Each of them is three edges of resistance one, which combined is an edge of resistance three. It turns out that the electric flow here sends half a unit on the ST edge and one sixth unit on each of the three pads below. In this way, electric flow kind of, it interpolates between wanting to take shorter pads, but also not putting everything on the shortest path. And one more point I wanted to make is that longer pads, which have quote, higher resistance in some sense, get less flow on them. At this one, I'm going to hop into the interior point framework that has been used by previous approaches like ours and how we adapt to greater methods. So an interior point method, what it maintains in general, or for the instance of max flow, at every point, the algorithm is gonna maintain a flow uh, from S to T that sends V units. Additionally, we're gonna maintain forward weights and backward weights on every edge. Um, the guarantee we're gonna to try to maintain on our flow F is that it's a minimizer of this weighted log barrier. We wanna send one unit of flow from S to T, uh, not one unit, V units of flow from S to T and we're gonna minimize this log barrier. The log barrier has the following pieces. Um, the flow is constrained linearly. And in addition, the log piece, um, 
it ensures that we don't saturate the forward and backwards capacities too much. And finally, the weights um, WE plus and WE minus, they weight how much we care about not sat, not like breaking the capacity constraints at the edge. So yeah. what our algorithm is gonna do is we're gonna maintain the minimizers of this log barrier as we increase the value of V and send more flow from S to T. So going back to this formula, um, so let's say that we have a flow of value V uh, currently from S to T. And our question is, how are we gonna send more units from S to T while still minimizing this function? Um, what we're gonna call this is a progress step. Um, and the goal of a progress step is we're going to increase the amount of units we're sending from S to T from V to V plus Delta while still kind of being close to minimizing this function. Um, then the other piece of a classical IPM is a centering step. Here what a centering step does is you start from an approximately minimal point to this potential function, this log barrier, and then you solve some uh, Laplacian systems to move to an exact minimizer. In this step, we don't increase the value of V, we just ensure that we're at a true minimizer instead of an approximate minimizer now. To get past the M to the three half time algorithms, our goal is to change weights to ensure larger progress steps. While in classical interior point methods, um, the, run, the amount of steps we have to take to get a high accuracy solution is root L. In our method, we're going to change the weights. Well, in our method and the previous method of Madri, we're gonna change the weights to allow for the progress steps to be larger than um, one over root M multiplicative progress. And to make sure the algorithm doesn't blow up, we need to maintain that the sum of the weights is the most O of M. Um, initially, they're all one, so the sum is like two M. We just don't need it. We just need to make sure it doesn't go up by more than a constant X. So the thing I want to explain now is um, what is preventing the algorithm, which adds electric flows at every step from making larger progress steps? Like why are the progress steps forced to be small sometimes? And intuitively what's going on is this. Our algorithm is maintaining this flow F that routes V units from S to T at every point in time. And we want to add some electric flow to this to route more units. However, when the amount of flow, the electric flow wants to put on an edge E is large compared to the residual capacities, um, then we can't add that much of the electric flow. So the algorithm can't make as much progress. This issue um, is what causes the naive interior point method to get an M to the 1.5 runtime. However, previous works of CKMST and Madri they show that when an electric flow edge is congested, that it's natural that the right thing to do is to increase the resistance of the edge. When you increase the resistance of the edge, the amount of flow on the edge will go down because the resistance went up. So the flow wants to use that edge less. So to increase the resistance, we're going to increase um, the weights W plus and W minus. And to analyze it, we track electric energy as a potential function. So yeah, this is how the previous methods worked, the methods of Madri and CKMST. They say when the electric flow congested edge, um, they increase the weights of the edges, um, W plus and W minus, and then doing that increases the resistance and therefore the method will wanna use the edge less. And then you trade off how much weight increase I've done using this and how much I can reduce the congestion. So uh, now I'm going to explain how we're going to improve on this. The previous approaches to increasing resistance to reduce congestion was to look at the electric flow 
and then take eddy edges that had high congestion or electric energy and increase the resistances combinatorially. What we're instead going to do is treat, in, treat increasing resistances and increasing energy as its own optimization problem. Um, so we're gonna define this energy maximization problem under a weight budget and then solve it and prove that uh, by solving this problem, we automatically reduce congestion in some sense. To talk about this energy maximization idea, I need to introduce the energy maximization problem. Uh, the formal way I'm going to introduce the energy maximization problem is that we're going to have an underlying graph G with edge resistances. I'm going to let CE be the cost in weight increase to increase the resistance of edge E by one. And W is the total weight budget I'm willing to pay. The energy maximization problem we define then is how do we maximize the energy of the electric flow under this weight budget W? And this can be expressed by the following problem. Um, max over C R prime one normos W. Um, so C here is the diagonal cost matrix and R prime is the resistance increase. So um, that constraint is just, um, I'm only willing to pay W units of weight increase. We're gonna maximize the energy under this constraint. Recall that the electric energy is we're minimizing sending overall flow sending one unit from S to T of the two norm of F with respect to resistances. At this point, we can flip the maximum in um, by duality and we're gonna unravel it now. If we keep unraveling it, uh, what you get is there's two parts. First, you get this two norm part, it still stays. But additionally, there's this max over the constraints of the two norm of F with respect to R prime. This one norm constraint in the dual becomes infinity norm. So the thing we end up with is um, this energy maximization problem is equivalent to minimizing over all ways of sending one unit from S to T of a two norm piece, the electric piece, plus some infinity norm piece that's weighted. And this is a flow problem. Like in particular, maximizing energy, uh, while it's not like clear at all that this is equivalent to like minimizing uh, some undirected objective, this calculation shows that if we want to solve energy maximization, it's really equivalent to solving some undirected flow problem in a mixed two plus infinity norm. So how do we solve this problem? And how do we use it in our algorithm? Turns out that actually exactly solving this is, well, like it's impossible or circular at least, because if there was no two norm piece, this is just minimizing the infinity norm. So that exactly becomes the max flow problem, which what we're trying to solve in the first place anyways. However, because we're only using this problem to influence how we're changing the weights, that part can actually be a little looser. So we show that we can approximately solve this objective by turning the infinity into a P and then applying this result I mentioned earlier of this two norm flow plus this P norm flow, um, this result of King Peng Sedge Devil Wong to give an approximate solution to this and use this to inform our weight changes. I'll go into some more detail later about how exactly we can approximately solve this and get away with it. But for now, um, what I want to just, just to say is that what Algon's gonna do is we're going to approximately solve some energy maximization problem using this two plus P norm result of King Peng Sach Jeva Wang then we're gonna use that to figure out the weight changes we should have done. By doing this, we can show that um, because we've increased the energy so much um, that the congestion of the electric flow can't be high anymore and that allows us to make more progress. So, So 
So that kind of finishes up like the first key point I wanted to make. So in this part, we were still influenced by electric flows. What we said is, let's start with an electric flow. We want to make sure that the electric flow has high congestion. And we got an energy maximization problem out of it. In the next part of this talk, I'm going to ask the question, why are we using electric flows in the first place for interior point methods? And can we actually not use them and get something better? Yeah. To understand this, what I first wanted to explain is how you can actually derive that inside an interior point method, that taking steps should be using electric flows. Like at least why it's a very natural thing to do. Just to set it up, I wanted to remind everyone that we have this weighted log barrier VF, which is um, the sum of well, negative the weights times the log of the um, residual capacities. In addition, we have a flow F or FV, which is the minimizer over all ways of sending V units from S to T of the log barrier. So when we want to take a progress step, our goal was to add a flow F hat to F, which routes delta more S to units. So we would increase the amount of flow we're sending from S to T from V to V plus delta by adding F hat. And additionally, we want it to still be central, like to be a minimizer of this. To start the calculation uh, of explaining why F hat should look kind of like an electric flow, we first want to note that by the KKT conditions or like Lagrange multipliers, that if we have a minimizer of uh, VF, then there should be a dual variable y such that by equals the gradient of vf, like the gradient of the log barrier. Because both f plus f hat and f are minimizers of this for different values of v, their difference of gradients should also be in the image of v. So there should be a vector phi such that b phi equals the difference of the gradients. And when you expand it out uh, and take the derivative of log, you get this following expression. Now, when I take this, and let's say I take the first order expansion of this, I like ignore the second order and higher terms. What I end up with is the following expression. I get something times F hat. If we stare at this equation, what you can see is that the thing in front of F hat, we can look at as resistances and these, and these resistances are given by the Hessian of VF. And I tried to use notation uh, for phi. So what you get is B phi equals some resistances times F hat. So this says that, oh, if I'm just using some approximation to this difference to the first order, then I get B phi equals some resistance times F hat. So F hat is really just induced by an electric flow with those resistances. Um, so yeah, it's approximately an electric flow, not exactly, but approximately. The thing I would really wanna point out is that it's approximately an electric flow, not exactly because of this approximation that I did. To understand what the error in the approximation is, um, as explained, when I was doing this calculation, we tossed out the second order and higher terms. So the error is just the second order term, this expression. And in an interior point method, um, the centrality measure that we need to maintain is small to do a centering step, dependently L2 norm of the error. Uh, the L2 norm of this error is if you square F hat squared, so you get F hat to the fourth power. So it ends up being an L4 norm. And it's the fourth norm of this vector rho that I'm going to call the congestion. To understand why I'm calling it the congestion, the thing it's defined as is, is F hat over 
the min of the forwards and backwards residual capacity. So f hat is the flow we're trying to add. And um, rho is the residual is rho is the congestion with respect to the residual capacities of like the current flow that I already have f. At this point, I'm going to try to explain why this four norm is actually a little mysterious and what we really should expect to be like the truth for a working method. The first thing to notice is that as long as the infinity norm of this congestion vector is at most one, the flow f plus f hat actually is feasible because rho infinity being at most one just means that the flow f how we're trying to add does not saturate the residual capacity. So if we add it, it's still feasible. However, remember that the error we got on the previous slide was the four norm of rho. And this kind of explains why the corrections, well, this is the reason why the correction steps in the interior point method are possible if and only if the four norm of rho is at most one over 10, say. So there's a difference here. Um, we can add the flow f hat without like violating capacity constraints as long as the infinity norm is the most one. However, because of this like correction step in the IPM and this error induced by electric flows, we actually need to maintain something stronger. The four norm is at most 110. And this difference is kind of what caused our first result to be m to the 11 8th instead of m to the 4 thirds. To get past this issue, uh, as I was explaining, um, we're actually just not going to use electric flows anymore. Electric flows, because they're only cons like considered the first order approximation, they lost some second order error and that accumulated in this row four norm. Instead, so what we're gonna do is we're just not going to use electric flows and we're not going to pay this, um, for this like second order error in the centrality. You know, like exactly maintain we're central and therefore you can focus on the infinity norm. Um, that's like the high level idea. To do this, we're going to find a flow f hat such that if we added it, then the centrality error just doesn't change at all. Like we stay exactly central, unlike the electric flow allowed us to do. To do this, we're going to let f hat be the minimizer of the Bregman divergence of the barrier instead of some electric flow corresponding to the resistances. Um, in particular, f hat is the minimizer over all ways to send delta units from S to T of the Bregman divergence with respect to the log barrier. The reason this is useful or ends up being the right thing to do is that if you use the KKT conditions again, you get that there's a potential phi such that B phi is the gradient of the objective, which is the gradient of V of like uh, F plus F hat minus the gradient at F. If the flow F was already central as that, that's the property we're maintaining, then the gradient of V at F already equals BY for some dual variable Y. So if you add these, then you get B times Y plus V equals the gradient at F plus F hat. In particular, the gradient at F plus F hat is again in the image of B. So that means that F plus F hat is actually perfectly um, a minimizer of this log barrier V. On the other hand, when we use the electric flow, it wasn't perfectly a minimizer. It was only approximately a minimizer. And that's what we paid this four norm. To kind of understand the relationship between this divergence and the electric flow, something useful to notice is that the divergence is defined to be, I take the function and I exactly subtract out the first order Taylor approximation. And when I do that, I'm only left with second order terms. So like, you know, F hat squared. 
So if you imagine replacing that divergence expression with just some constants times f hat squared, um, and you know, defining f hat this way, then it's actually exactly an electric flow because the second order is you know some L two norm. So then f hat is an electric flow. So I, the point of that was just to um, emphasize that the, the divergence thing is really an extension or like a more exact way than computing electric flows for uh, advancing it interior point methods. So yeah, um, that, um, that was like the second main point, which is that instead of using electric flows, we're just not going to use them at all. We're gonna define this new divergence minimizing flow and take steps with that instead. And by doing that, we don't incur any error. So our algorithm can be more efficient. Okay. To wrap everything up, I'm going to explain how to put all the pieces together and get a working full algorithm. The algorithm for our m to the four thirds time max flow um, can be described in the following steps. The first step is you reduce G to an undirected graph. And then you repeat the following process for M to the one third steps. We're gonna take this divergence objective that I wrote on the earlier slide, like minimizing this Bregman divergence. And we're going to apply a variant of the energy maximization um, in the earlier part of the talk on this. This will result in some undirected flow problem, which we solve approximately. This will give us weights, and then we augment the flow after changing the weights. And finally, where there's m to the one third units of flow left, we uh, quit our algorithm and we just run augmenting pads until we're done. So the point is that every step of this can be executed in linear time because of this L2 LP norm flow result of King Peng Sajjab Wang I mentioned earlier. And finally, because we quit when there's M to the one third unit left, um, augmenting pads can finish in M to the four thirds time. So that's where we achieve our runtime. So just to wrap up the end of the talk, I'm going to highlight two main pieces. The first is how we're actually going to solve these um, divergence objectives or energy maximization problem using this L2 plus LP flow solver. And then I'm going to give everyone a taste of where these exponents of like 11 eighths and four thirds come from. Like what, what are the trade-offs and why is one worse than the other things like that. So okay, let's go back to the energy maximization problem. We're maximizing over some weight budget of the electric energy of the flow. And we proved that this is equivalent to minimizing over all flow sending one unit from S to T of a mixed um, electric flow piece plus an L infinity piece. We claimed that we could do this by um, using the following two norm plus P norm flow of King Peng Sajj Devo Wong. So there's a couple of differences between these that I just wanted to mention um, how we get around them. For the an L infinity for LP piece, we prove that P equals root log N is good enough because the distortion between the norms is M to the little O of one. So we just paid that in our runtime. Another issue is that I said we initially wanted weight increases, but we're solving a flow problem instead. So how do we get the weights out of that? Well, for this energy maximization problem, we set it up with this min max and we flipped it. So by duality, taking a derivative or like a gradient of our final flow will actually give us weight changes. Also, uh, it's the infinity norm squared versus the P norm to the P. So like the exponent differs, uh, but you can prove that you can reduce these via doing a line search. And finally, there's some issue where the energy maximization problem we need does not have a unit weights, but there's some way we get around that with some tricks. But yeah, the point is you're just gonna set the cost equal to one and then do tricks after that because 
we really only know how to solve the um, two plus p flow when um, the piece, or like the p norm piece, has unit weights. So this was how we solved the energy maximization problem. To solve this divergence version that I mentioned, um, you can't as directly apply what they do, but instead what we prove is that using the techniques built in this paper of King Peng says Jeva Wang, you can reduce solving the divergence problem to solving M to the little o one instances of uh, this L2 plus LP norm flow. And that's um, good enough to still maintain an almost linear runtime. Yeah, um, at this point, I'm just gonna describe some, like where the X ones four thirds and 11 eighths come from and uh, kind of why one is worse than the other. In general, to do these trade-offs, we're gonna say, we're gonna let C be a small constant and aim for an M to the three halves minus C runtime. A key lemma in all these methods that kind of comes from interior point theory is that if we want to route a one, a delta fraction of the remaining flow, then the two norm of the congestion vector is the most delta root M. So in particular, if delta is M to the minus one half, then the two norm of congestion is at most one and therefore no edge is congested. So we can just take a step. So in particular, I can route M to the minus one half units every step and this will just recover standard interior point theory. However, we want to take delta to be larger. We want to take it to be m to the minus one half plus c. What you can prove is that as long as the amount of residual flow is at least m to the one half minus c, and we're taking steps of size um, m to the minus one half plus c, then if I'm willing to pay weight increase w for my step, then I can get the infinity norm down to m to the two c over root w. Oh, uh, this is a level we prove. So if we had taken the weights W to be M to the four C, then the L infinity norm is almost most one tenth. And this is actually sufficient for a divergence based method because we just wanted to guarantee that the infinity norm of this congestion is small. Um, because our interior point method is taking M to the one half minus C steps and every step we're paying weight change four C for C equals one sixth, this total weight is a most M. Uh, and that's fine because our only invariant is we wanted to maintain that the sum of weights is O of M. And therefore our runtime is M to the one, three half minus C, which is M to the four thirds. For the M to the 11 eighths time algorithm, which we based on using electric flows, our goal was to ensure that the four norm of this congestion vector is the most one tenth instead of the infinity norm. Uh, going back to our previous lemmas, the two norm is the most delta times root m. And additionally, the weight change lemma still holds. Um, we can get the infinity norm down to m to the two c over root w if we're willing to pay w units of weight change. In this case, however, we needed for the four norm to be at most one tenth instead of the infinity norm. So if the set W larger, have set it to be like M to the six C. If W is M to the six C, well, you can show that the two norm is the most M to the C and the infinity norm is gonna be M to the minus C over hundred, something like that. And therefore you know, the four norm is the most one tenth from this. Um, the thing to note is that because we had to get the four norm small, we had to make the infinity norm even smaller, like much less than one tenth by a factor of M to the C. And that cost us a weight change. Putting this all together, the total weight increase over um, our rounds is M to the one half minus C, which is number of rounds times W, which is M to the one half plus five C. So for C equals one tenth, this is at most M. Plug in that value, this gives you an M to the three halves minus C, which is M to the seven fifths, M to the 1.4 runtime. Uh, so interestingly, this is actually larger than the thing I claimed, which is M to the 11 eighths or 1.375. Uh, 
in the paper, we have to do some additional, what we call weight reduction tricks to get M to the 11 eighth. But uh, regardless of that, I think the point is that because we had to guarantee the four norm smaller, we had to ensure, we had to like damp the infinity norm even more. And that just cost us a lot more weight change to do. And that's why the runtime ends up being worse. Okay, at this point, I just wanted to wrap everything up and talk about some future directions or like open problems that I think are interesting to pursue. One thing is that our algorithms really strongly use uh, this L2 plus LP flow, but it's not actually known how to solve LP flows when you have weighted graphs. It, the result only works for unweighted graphs, not weighted graphs. So it'd be really interesting to see if you can solve a weighted graph, even though I don't know how to directly apply this inside any method to get an improved Maxwell algorithm. Additionally, um, as, I, as you can see, like interior point methods are a provable way to get linear programming or Maxwell runtimes. But I think it's definitely possible that, it's, that there's some Maxwell algorithm out there that doesn't even talk about interior point methods really like more directly iterates using some p-norm flow. So I think that's really interesting. Um, additionally, on sparse graphs, it's actually not known whether you can achieve, um, sorry, on sparse graphs that have large capacity, like polynomial capacities, it's not known whether you can achieve anything better than n to the 1.5 still. Um, even though, yeah, our algorithms only work in unit capacity graphs. And finally, I just wanted to mention an interesting aspect of our algorithm that, that you know, it, it naturally introduces some uh, open questions. You can actually prove that if you run through the analysis and do the trade-offs a little more carefully, we can show that for any epsilon greater than zero, um, we can compute a flow which routes all but epsilon mu units. And we can do this in time m to, uh, m to the one plus the rule of one over root epsilon. And then if you trade off epsilon properly, that's how you get our m to the four thirds one time. So we said we can get an additive flow approximation in time m over root epsilon. So this at least made me wonder um, whether you can get an epsilon approximate max flow in runtime m over root epsilon. The current best runtime is m over epsilon. So this would be very interesting if you can actually do this. And yeah, that's my talk and I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks Yang, that was a great talk. We can, um out see there's more questions um and if not i can also stop the recording and we can just people can keep asking um hello i do have one quick question yes um so in your algorithm uh, where precisely it uh, is the bottleneck of the polynomial dependency on the capacity the key bottleneck in your algorithm. Yeah, um, the, yeah, the key bottleneck to the polynomial dependence on capacity is that the amount of weight you have to, the amount of weight change you have to do to reduce the L, like to reduce the L infinity norm of the congestion depends on the weights U. Like, yeah, it depends on the weights, uh, sorry, it depends on the capacities U. So that's like where the key bottleneck is. I think it's actually more natural when you think of it in the epsilon approximate sense. It says that when there's really very little flow left, then we have to pay a lot of weight change and this kind of, yeah, so that's what's going on. Thank you. Uh, what is the best known lower bound for the unit flow problem? Um, yeah, the question was, yeah, the question was, what was the best known lower bound? 
Uh, I think for any max flow problem, for just like single max flow, the best node is just M. Like there's nothing known. In fact, like I would not, be, I would conjecture that the runtime is M for all these problems in even the capacitated case. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll stop the recording now.